you're standing on the promises of God today. Amen? All right. Well, hey, it's a wonderful thing to be with you this morning. So glad to see each and every one of you. Although I've got to tell you, I'm a little disappointed because most of you I haven't seen since last year. So anyway, so anyway, well, that, that kind of uh, goes without saying, I suppose. Happy New Year to all of you. And uh, it, is, it is a good thing to be together in the house of the Lord. And it's good to uh, come here to hopefully begin a new thing for this new year. Last week's sermon, I believe that... Uh, Pastor Bowman preached was 2020 vision, and so maybe this week we're going to talk about something very similar, your vision for 2020. In fact, I'm reminded of the story that I pulled out of a paper the other day about a gentleman who had made a New Year's resolution. For many of you, New Year's is a time to make new resolutions. How many of you have made a New Year's resolution already? Any of you? A few of you? For most of us, it's probably not wise because we don't follow through on it anyway. Well, this fellow had made out several years worth of New Year's resolutions and he decided to put them down to paper and so this is what his successive list of New Year's resolutions read. He said in 2013 I will get my weight down below 180. 2014 I will watch my calories until I get below 190. 2015 I will follow my new diet religiously until I get under 200. 2016 I'll try to develop a realistic attitude about my weight 2017, I will work out five days a week. 2018, I'll work out three days a week. And then I think in 2019, he said that he would try to drive past the gym at least once a week, if at all humanly possible. So anyway, hopefully you've made your New Year's resolutions. Resolutions are good things or can be good things. They can help uh, chart a course of success for us. But the question I have for you this morning, for 2020 with respect to New Year's resolutions is, have you made a resolution to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ? What resolutions have you made with respect to your relationship with God? I mean, shouldn't we also be considering how it is that we might stretch ourselves and grow in our faith in this new year? If you're not growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, I'd ask you, why not? The scripture tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18 that we need to do just that. And so, again, I want to encourage you to make plans to grow. The other day, in fact, as I was going about my business, I noticed just how aggressive and pushy pe- people seem to be getting. And this kind of ties into this desire that I have to kind of strike out in a new way for a new year. Because I've even found myself getting a little bit on edge, irritable with people I found that I had a very short fuse after Christmas. Now, lots of travel and very little sleep didn't really help that situation at all, not to mention the fact that I've been coming down with something. So hopefully I make it through the message today. If not, you get to lunch much quicker. So anyway, it is really strange how quickly that Christmas spirit, all of that good news and goodwill toward men and women so quickly disappears or can. As I considered my own selfish and sinful ways, I made a resolution to try to do better in 2020, especially in my interactions to other people. And so this morning, our lesson comes to us from Colossians chapter 3. If you have your Bibles handy, turn over to Colossians chapter 3. Here in these verses in Colossians chapter 3, we're reminded of how God would have us to treat those around us. And so to front load expectations for this message today, as we begin 2020, I want to encourage each and every one of you, all of us, to make it a resolution to treat every person that we come into contact with in a manner that is pleasing to God, in a manner that would bring Him glory and that would help us as we share Jesus with people. Amen? That ought to be the the heart's desire of every believer. And so this morning... I want us to look at Paul's words in Colossians chapter 3. God, through the Apostle Paul, gives us a number of attitudes to aspire to during this next year. And so if you're able, I'd ask you to stand this morning and turn, if you will, over to Colossians 3, and we will read together verses 1 through 17. I'm going to paraphrase verses 1 through 11. In verses 1 through 11, the Apostle Paul basically says this, and I paraphrase, concentrate on heavenly values and not on earthly things and the earthly desires and passions of the flesh to which you have died. And in like manner, having put on the new you, look beyond the distinctions of men 
to see them as they are in Christ Jesus or as Christ would have them to be. Now picking up in verse 12, so as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone. Just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Let's pray. Almighty, gracious, and loving God, we thank you so much for your word. God, we ask that we would take seriously Paul's encouragement, his challenge, that we might put on these attitudes that he, have, he has suggested are so powerful in our walk as believers in Jesus Christ. Father, help us to clothe ourselves in these things, we pray. Accomplish with your word that which you purpose for it today in us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> well, here in Colossians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul does kind of an interesting thing. He employs the metaphor of clothing. Just as you would put on a brand new shirt or a crisp pair of purchased pants or a fresh bought dress, here the Apostle Paul tells us to put on certain attitudes. Well, notice first that Paul mentions donning a heart of compassion. He said, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion. Now, when I was a chaplain at First Recruit Training Battalion, Marine Corps Recruit Depot, Paris Island, I used to sit, on, sit in on forming day in something called pickup briefs. Now, that was the first introduction of new recruits to their series commander and to those doting, soft-spoken people called drill instructors. Any of you that have ever been to Paris Island or San Diego or have ever been through boot camp of any kind know that drill instructors or drill sergeants are not usually very soft-spoken people. But uh, anyway, I used to sit in on these briefs, and it was always an interesting time. We would go out and we would PT with them first, and so usually they were pretty smoked or spent, and then we would go and they would actually meet their leadership. Well, it always interested me that one of the, the, the lines in the senior drill instructor uh, pickup speech was this. They promised to treat them with firmness, fairness, dignity, and compassion. Firmness always. Fairness most of the time. Dignity some of the time. Compassion, I'm not so sure about that one. I'm not sure they ever really succeeded on that. Well, compassion is something that's very important. Compassion is an interesting word. So, so what is it? What is compassion? Well, literally, the word means with passion. I would tell you this morning that compassion is feeling for or feeling along with another. And so it's a, a combination of sympathy and empathy. It's the opposite of being cold and heartless. A compassionate person is not someone who is concerned only with themselves, but who looks out for others. Someone that is concerned about and sensitive to others and what they are thinking, feeling, and going through. Mother Teresa was a compassionate person. Regardless of your opinion of the totality of her theology, she was a woman of compassion. She was known for reaching out to and living among the poor and the diseased. In fact, she would not only go out there and care for them, she was willing to literally hug and to hold them, to put her hands on them, to touch them and embrace them. What an incredible demonstration of compassion. In fact, in 1950, she started the Sisters of Charity, which later became the Missionaries of Charity as men's orders were instituted. Charity or grace is an interesting thing. Charity, grace, is often associated with those who are compassionate. Now, I must be totally honest and say that I'm not sure that I'd get high marks on this particular trait. 
how about you? We may not want to wear our emotions on our sleeves. We may feel uncomfortable being too compassionate, too sensitive. But that's exactly the way that the Apostle Paul says that we're supposed to be. That's exactly what he encourages us to do. To put on or to clothe ourselves with compassion. Now he then moves on to kindness. Now kindness includes not only saying nice things about people, but doing nice things for people. Kindness is going above and beyond the call of duty to help someone else out. I've got to tell you, several months ago, I was extended a very tender kindness by a young child. You see, I had taken my granddaughter over to Chick-fil-A. I wanted to get ice creams for us. So we walked into Chick-fil-A, but immediately she noticed the play structure. So she was much more intent upon going into the play structure and playing than she was on having ice cream. So I allowed her to go in there, I purchased our ice creams, and then I went back into the enclosed room. Well, no sooner did I get into this little room and get seated with our ice creams than this little fellow, couldn't have been more than four years old, came up and looked at me with his big blue eyes, and he tugged on my shirt saying, Mr., you can't be in here. You're going to get in trouble. You're not allowed to have your shoes on and to have food in here. Well, I've got to tell you, I wanted to just pick him up and hug him. He was so cute. But I figured, you know, I might get arrested. So I didn't do that, but I did shake his hand. And I thanked him. What a wonderful kindness this little guy demonstrated for me. He was so polite. He was humble. He was respectful in an age-appropriate way. He was kind. Friends, we need to be kind. It's amazing what a little bit of kindness will do. This little guy taught me a lesson. He reminded me of the importance of being kind. He was also humble. And that's the next quality that Paul notes for us is humility. Humility is probably something that most all of us could work on to some degree or another. To be humble means that you recognize your own weaknesses and your own shortcomings. You don't consume yourself thinking about just how great you are. You don't spend all of your time telling everybody else all of the incredible things that you've been doing. No, you take time for them. Do you know someone who likes to talk about themselves all of the time? Rhonda, please don't answer that. Do you know someone that just spends all of their time talking about themselves? Well, the Bible says don't be that person. Clothe yourselves with humility. Well, humility is with respect to oneself. Then there is another thing called gentleness. Paul said that we ought to be gentle. Now, gentleness or meekness is the manner in which we act toward or the way that we treat other people people humility is an internal thing gentleness or meekness is an external thing i wonder if i should just quit while i'm i'm behind i'm not stacking up too well to what paul is suggesting here be that as it may gentleness is the opposite of road rage i mean harshness or roughness gentleness is the opposite of the man or the woman ranting and raving at their spouse or the parent inciting or provoking their child to wrath. In fact, in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 5, God through Paul said, Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. Listen, familiarity may breed contempt, but we must still treat our family members, friends, loved ones, co-workers, and neighbors, as well as all others, with respect, being very patient, and understanding. We must be gentle and meek toward them. Now let me pause and ask. I've shared with you about me, but what about you? What's your scorecard look like? How is it adding up for you? Again, mine's pretty marked up. Paul said that we should try to treat the people around us very, very carefully. Clothe yourself with gentleness. And yes, as I stated a moment ago, we need to be patient, which is our next be attitude or attitude to be. Someone once said to me that patience is a virtue. 
To which I quickly responded, well, I'm not a very virtuous person. Patience is a difficult thing, isn't it? And you guys aren't helping me a bit because you're not laughing in areas that you're supposed to laugh. That are supposed to be humorous. Help me out here so I don't feel too bad about myself. Patience is a difficult thing. I'm patient most of the time. I'm a pretty patient person as long as God and man don't keep me waiting too long. Now it's noteworthy here that the Greek word macrothymian incorporates or conveys the idea of being or remaining pleasant in unpleasant or undesirable, uncomfortable circumstances or conditions. That's why in some of your translations it is rendered long-suffering. So let's apply that. When the traffic isn't moving, when the fast food worker can't make change quickly enough or doesn't know how to ring you up, when your spouse or child does not respond quickly enough or to your liking, when God does not just simply say yes to your repeated prayer for health, healing, or deliverance and perform a miracle, are you patient? Are you willing to wait on the Lord or not? I guess the real question is, will you be patient? Is it even part of your desire? Can you say along with Job, though he slay me, yet will I hope in him, yet will I trust him, yet will I praise his name? It takes a lot of patience to do that. Friends, try to be patient with the people around you. And try to be patient with the Lord who is so patient and long-suffering with you and with me. Well, in order to do that, you must on, on a daily basis consider the glorious forgiveness that God has extended. That he has granted to you as a result of the atoning work of Jesus Christ. And furthermore, you must be willing to offer that forgiveness to others. Notice that Paul said, bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances that you have. Now sometimes the things that offend us are just petty. And by pettiness, I mean something that really isn't justified. We just get irritated because we get irritated. Maybe last night's nachos or enchiladas didn't sit well. Maybe you didn't get enough sleep. That's pettiness. Any of us can be petty. But then there are grievances, the word specifically used here. And what's implied here is something that is legitimate. Just the same, the Apostle Paul indicates that we are to forgive as the Lord has forgiven us. That's how Jesus wants us to be, to be quick to forgive the people around us. No grudges allowed. Paul challenges us from the corridors of time and eternity in the pages of Scripture to put on these attitudes as we are going and as we interact with other people. Now, a word to you right now to the wise. Don't forget to change your undergarments as well. Clean all over includes clean all under. In fact, it is that which undergirds these attitudes which makes all of the outward manifestation towards others possible. Notice the way the Apostle Paul begins verse 14. He says, beyond all these things. In other words, underneath all these things, or in order to manifest all of these attitudes and actions, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ, he said, rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Think about it for just a moment, if you will. It's pretty hard to curse and to swear at somebody else If you're busy singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with a heart of genuine thanksgiving. You can't really do both effectively or be convincing about it. Listen, I would tell you this morning, laughter is a good medicine. Music and singing is a balm for the soul and thankfulness 
is really one of the best therapies around. In fact, I would tell you this morning, if you don't sing, you need to start. Now, you may say, oh, man, I can't even carry a tune. That would be a disaster. I don't want to let anyone hear me sing. Well, listen, the Bible just says make a joyful noise. It doesn't say a skillful noise. Just sing. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody, a perfect harmony. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of love. Sing if you can't do any other thing. So this morning, I'd like to conclude this message by being among the first to encourage you. By being among the first to challenge you. To resolve in 2020 to seek to honor God and to share Christ by making it your goal to step up the way that you treat other people. I really want to challenge you to consider how it is that you may lift other people to live on a higher level. That may mean sharing Jesus Christ with someone that needs salvation. It may be encouraging a hurting soul that just needs recommitment or needs to be refreshed. It may mean coming alongside of someone and just being kind, supporting them through struggles or challenges that they're facing. Make them feel special. Or as Tim McGraw would say, sing, always stay humble and kind, as well as compassionate, gentle, and patient with everyone that you meet. And remember, it's Christ's love which binds all of these attitudes, these attributes, and all we who believe together in perfect unity. And it's Christ's love and his peace in our hearts, as well as his word, which Paul said dwells richly within us, we who believe, that enables us to demonstrate and to communicate the good news to a lost and dying world of sinners who are desperately in need of a savior. Remember, they'll know we are Christians not by our elegance, not by our eloquence, not by our intelligence, but they will know we are Christians by our love. Ultimately, ultimately it's Christ's love which affords all we who are saved the opportunity to respond, to repent, and to receive forgiveness and salvation something we do not deserve. God has given us a wonderful gift, as was said earlier, and we need to remember it, especially this time of year. May your New Year's resolution be to live out Colossians chapter 3, and as you do, may the world see a new you in this new year. Let us pray. Almighty, gracious, and loving God, we thank you.